Hello, well, thank you for staying for the very last talk of the conference. And I hope it makes it uh, slightly interesting. So, uh, fairly uh, straightforward outline, I suppose. I'm going to first talk to you a little bit about cosmology and inflation and where all this fits in. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about preheating and just essentially explain what the word means and why we study it. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we study preheating and the simulation code that I wrote with some of my collaborators. And then we're going to talk about oscillons, uh, mainly because they produce the prettiest pictures. And then I'll conclude. Aha. Okay, so the, this is the standard timeline of the universe. Nice graphic produced by the people who made the WMAP satellite. And so Paul gave a very nice talk a couple days ago, talked about galaxies and, you know, that have stars and all this other nice stuff that we can see. And I don't work on any of this, really. Uh, or at least I didn't. So the, uh, so we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. So the beginning here, it says quantum fluctuations. And uh, there is a sort of standard assumption that uh, whatever we have back here at the very, very beginning, you can almost call it sort of before the Big Bang, I'll explain that in a second, uh, with some sort of quantum field or something like that that produced things kind of like quantum fluctuations. And then we have the universe going through this phase known as inflation, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. And then it blew up by a huge factor. We generally talk about something like 50, 60, 70 e-folds, so that's e to the 50, or e to the 60, or e to the 70, uh, which is a huge number, obviously. But then again, the universe is pretty big, so you know, huge numbers are appropriate. Uh, so in any case, so the universe blew up, and then somehow we got all this stuff, and the stuff was sloshing around in some large plasma. Right? And so there are nice people, like the people at, at Rick at Brookhaven, or what have you, that you know, simulate or uh, do experiments with quark gluon plasmas. And that stuff is over there, and then, or maybe over here, and uh, then eventually the universe expanded and it cooled, and uh, these quark gluon plasmas turned into you know, protons and neutrons, and you had a bunch of electrons, and you had a bunch of photons, and there's this dark matter stuff, which is actually most of the stuff, but we don't know anything about it. And so all that cooled down, and eventually you got this cosmic microwave background radiation. And this was produced when the photons were no longer energetic enough to keep the plasma ionized. And then here's, this formed into mostly neutral hydrogen, that's why it's dark. And then eventually that collapsed into stars and galaxies, all this stuff. So the problem is that we have to try and study the stuff over here when all we can see is from here on out. And hopefully, this will tell us about this will tell us about the stuff that happened at the beginning of the universe. So, of course, most people have heard about the Big Bang cosmology, right, which is our sort of quote-unquote standard cosmological model. But actually, it's not really the standard cosmological model anymore. We have built on it, hopefully, and have come up with extensions. One of the most common, I should say, the most common extension to Big Bang cosmology is what we call inflationary cosmology, and Inflationary cosmology is motivated because there are issues with Big Bang cosmology. Not that Big Bang cosmology gets anything wrong, but there are a lot of things that it doesn't explain very well. So, for instance, Big Bang cosmology does a really great job of explaining observed nucleosynthesis results, and it explains why the universe looks like it's expanding, and all these sort of basic things. But if you actually look at the model in detail, there are these issues. So one issue is that if you look out over the entire universe, it's really very homogeneous, much more homogeneous than you would expect. Because if you actually go through the math, it turns out that the whole, the whole portion of the universe that you can see on the sky could not possibly have thermalized in the, in the time necessary before the structure formed. So what this means is, since there's no causal thermodynamic process that could make everything so uniform, we don't know why it is. And that bothers us. Then there's the fact that the universe is so flat. I mean, of course, you know, we all remember, you know, years and years ago, people used to think the universe could be really wacky. You know, maybe there were wormholes and, you know, 
loops and all sorts of stuff. But actually, from all the observations we've ever been able to do, the universe is almost completely flat. Very uninteresting. And which is interesting because, <laughs> because a universe which is completely flat is actually an unstable fixed point of the evolution equation. So to explain why it looks so flat now, it had to be unbelievably flat at the beginning of the universe. And we have no idea why that would be. So then we also, if you look, so even though the universe is very homo homogeneous, there obviously are perturbations, because we are perturbations. And, uh, but these perturbations have this nearly scale-free structure. In other words, if you plotted the power spectrum of these perturbations, it looked like a power law all the way out to the largest scale. The problem with this is that, again, we run into this causality issue. There's no way, we have no idea, the standard Big Bang picture, how any causal process, and a causal process just means some process where cause precedes effect, could cause something like this. So that, again, is interesting. And there are other things. But, so, someone proposed I'm not going to go through the whole history, but the, the, there, there, there have been proposals that inflation. Well, what does inflation mean? Inflation just means, well, well, maybe we don't see most of the universe. Maybe the part of the universe we see was just some itty-bitty little part, you know, some subatomic little piece, that was blown up to the, to the entire, you know, observable universe, well, more than entire, the, the entire observable universe, and blown up by this huge factor, like e to the 60. And... So that's a very nice idea, I suppose, although perhaps a bit unsettling. Uh, and uh, because, of course, it also implies that the entire universe is at least e to the 60 times bigger than the part that we can see, right? So you have like philosophical arguments about whether that's a good thing or not. But in any case, uh, the, uh, it solves all these problems in a very natural way, right? Because you had this little itty bitty piece. So it could thermalize, got blown up, so and the, the process of blowing up tends to flatten everything out. So it's really flat. And, uh, and since you had these quantum, you know, you assume that there's some sort of quantum process going on on those really small scales, then that actually naturally explains the structure of the perturbations. So you're done. Except that, well, that would be boring. Well, the, the other issue is that that's not really a theory, right? It's just an idea. Like I just said, well, maybe it blew up. Okay, well, that's fine. But then you have to say, well, why? And what process caused it? And does that process produce other observable results? And so people actually started to try, make, try and make models of these things. And actually, it took uh, at least two decades for people to actually make models that were reasonable. And uh, it turns out, however, that the, the, the observables that are, produced, predict, that are predicted by these models that can differentiate them generally come out of strongly nonlinear processes. Um, you know, things like gravitational radiation, oscillons, we'll talk about in a minute, uh, phase transitions, uh, bubble nucleation, and even things like primordial black hole formation. Uh, and so this, the mechanism that, that I was studying was this mechanism called preheating. Well, what's preheating? Well, so what we do is we model inflation as this process that has this inflaton field, the fundamental field that we just made up. And, uh, but we don't really understand physics at those kind of energy scales anyway, so we just make something up. And, uh, so we made it up and we say, well, this thing caused inflation, and you can write that model for this one. But the problem is then that you have to get all the sort of energy that's in this field that's making the universe blow up to this, by this huge amount. You have to get it out and into normal stuff, right? So this is, this is preheating. This is, this is a, a resonant mechanism to get all this, the energy out of this field. And this is very qualitative, but we're going to see it. So, as I said, so we model these things as scalar fields. We're essentially solving this wave equation. As I said, we make it up, so we make it up to be simple. We actually can't make anything too complicated for technical reasons, so that works out pretty well. And uh, so we end up essentially solving this, this equation, just a wave equation. It has this drag term induced by the expansion of the universe. And you put in some potential. Here's a popular potential. Why is it popular? Because it's simple. Uh, there aren't very many terms and it's easy to solve. Actually, there are a lot more complicated ones. But in any case, you plug this into the uh, equation of the motion and you get something like this. This is actually what we solve. We have these two scalar fields. They're coupled. 
It's a nonlinear system, so we and we look at it numerically. Um, so one of the the code that I developed with my advisor and our other collaborator to to look at this uh, system was this code that we called Spectrum. Uh, it uses a it's a pseudospectral code, which is uh, turns out to be much better than the existing codes for similar problems and for this problem. So it has no finite differences. I'm not I don't think I have time particularly to go over any of the details. Um, I want to show you the pictures. And uh, so it's uh, with multi-core, parallelize it using OpenMP and FFTW and MKL for the FFTs, both of which support multi-threading. So that was nice. Um, integrates nicely with some known methods for doing gravitational wave calculations and this kind of thing. So that's also nice. Um, oh, I, I, I should also say that uh, part of the reason that we could get away with just doing this and not doing MPI is that my advisor bought this nice MacBook Pro, which uh, has 16 cores and 16 gigs of RAM or something. It's like our own little cluster in a box. Um, so you have to do some, it's a pseudospectral method, so you have to do some things to mitigate aliasing, like we just uh, did a grid padding method, and it improves energy conservation pretty well. Um, Here's a comparison versus uh, another existing code. This thing just sort of trails off to the energy conservation it gets prog progressively worse. And our code, you know, bumps around a bit, but is uh, significantly better in the long run. So I'm just going to show you some pictures of off. So one of the theories that uh, that you can do, uh, here's a, you know, I just reparameterized the potential here. And uh, it turns out that one of our collaborators and stuff, I mean, at MIT, predicted that a class of theories would predict these oscillating blobs called oscillons. And uh, if they existed in these theories, they would modify the, the predictions uh, perhaps significantly. So we, this is one of the things we wanted to investigate. And it, it turns out that he was right. So he, 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 here, here are the, these sort of shape predictions that he generated. And uh, why, why do we care? Well. We would care because if you if they're in these theories, then they could occupy something like 80% of the energy density of the universe. So that's a significant effect. Um, and so here I have these snapshots. But actually, maybe instead of showing you the snapshots, let's see if I can show you the. Uh, how do you get out of the? Uh, no. Okay. Maybe I won't show you the. Okay. In any case, I'll just show you some. So. Here's here, here's a here's a simulation. You can as the universe evolves. These are just contours of energy density. And as the system evolves, you get these little blobs that form. And these things are fairly long lived. And uh, so there's there's current work now on understanding these sort of exact predictions from these things. But this was this is a this is a novel result, and it's significant in this field because. People had generally assumed that this kind of stuff was unimportant. That you could essentially make all the predictions using a sort of you know linear perturbative analysis, and you could ignore any any in inherently nonlinear effects. Uh, but these are inherently nonlinear, and they're important. Um, okay. So I suppose this is where I'm, I should conclude. So the the conclusion is that. Uh, we have we have a code, a pseudo-special code, and it's it's currently the the best code for doing these kinds of calculations. Um, and we discovered that it's especially good for doing localized objects like these oscillons. And we've been studying these because, as I mentioned, they're important for understanding the detailed predictions of these kinds of theories. And not only that, but these oscillons are fairly generic. They actually appear in all sorts of theories in these places. And so while people thought they could just make predictions from perturbation theory, it turns out not to be true. Uh, you often do need to do these kinds of simulations, and we have a very good way of doing it. So, Ian, I'd like to acknowledge some people. This is my advisor and my thesis committee, our collaborator at MIT who did a lot of the theory work on oscillons, uh, some people who used to be at Yale who helped me out a lot, uh, CSGF, obviously, for paying me, and for the staff at Crowell who uh, made this uh, very pleasurable. Uh, and, and yeah, and the people at the department. And so, no. Thank you.